Our focus is on cities, so it's a good idea to trace cities back to their origins, to learn how they came to being, and to understand why they are the way they are today. Though today we make a clear distinction between urban and rural geographies, it is one of the great paradoxes of our time that cities, which is what we refer to as urban, are born of agriculture, which is what we refer to as rural. Before the early people learned farming, the first people were hunters and gatherers, and they were nomads where they followed their prey, and so they were always on the move wherever their prey led them. The images here show the early hunters hunting a wild boar on the left, and the early gatherers farming their crops with their first agricultural tools on the right. Even when the hunting was abundant, families of hunters did not live too close to each other. With agriculture, we're talking roughly about 800 BC when farming was introduced, agriculture and infrastructure in the built environment was born. People lived in groups and built themselves shelter near the lands that they cultivated. And that's because agriculture called for settled habitation in more durable structures and depended on cooperation. Then gradually, over time, the communities became larger and more of them came together. Greater investments were put into buildings and different functions for these buildings emerged. There became the temples for worship, places for the governing elites, storerooms for the farming products, baths and open spaces, walls for defense and the like. Demand for these agricultural produce, these prestige goods, created the exchange and stimulated trade and so that in turn depended on the proximity to sea or a great river. And so the village became the town and the town as it became large enough and important enough became the city. And there we have our first cities. Starting with the ancient world and extending to roughly about 100 AD, Uruk in Mesopotamia can be thought of as the first true city in the world. And the image on the left shows the ruins of what remains of Uruk. There are also the first cities of the oldest culture of the civilization of ancient Egypt, named Memphis and Thebes. The image of Thebes is shown on the right, with a backdrop of the hills of Thebes just across from the River Nile. A key factor to the emergence of these cities are the rivers they are adjacent to, the Euphrates for Uruk and the Nile for Memphis and Thebes. These rivers are the means of transport when roads were still virtually non-existent. In other parts of the world, there is Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus Valley, though very little of it is left above ground, but we know of them from ancient texts and monuments that have survived. Athens and Rome as well, much of them still standing today, so we have a good idea of what these cities looked like. The water body here for these maritime cities is the Mediterranean, which is more of a bridge between lands and cultures rather than a barrier. And one more city to mention, Jerusalem, which has a distinct position in history, being home to the Jewish and Christian and later Islamic religions. Moving along to the first millennium, and looking at a larger map of the world, two of the great cities are in Central America. Tikal, which is in modern-day Guatemala, and Teotihuacan, which is considered the largest city in the Americas at the time. And there's another in China, Chang'an, known today as Xi'an, which is considered to be the first city of one million people. The image on the left is an artist's model of Chang'an, which was the capital of the Tang Dynasty. Notice the grid-like map of the city. Most of the cities in the first millennium were Islamic, like Mecca, Damascus, Baghdad, and Cordoba, contrasting the same era in Europe known as the Dark Ages, which representing Christianity, there is only one city, Constantinople. The image on the right is an artist's depiction of the map of Constantinople. Notice the surrounding water body, which offers great access to the city. Constantinople was the capital of the Roman Empire and dominated the Eastern Mediterranean for almost a thousand years. In the medieval period, spanning from around 1000 AD to 1500 AD, the world of cities is looking to an even larger world. Cities are appearing in the north, south, east, and west, covering four of the world's continents. Cities are appearing as far north as Lubeck, 
in northern Germany. Other cities in Europe that stand out are Venice, Florence, and Sicily. The image on the left here is of Venice, situated among many islands, and was a city of great naval and commercial power because of its status as a port city. In the south, there's Cairo, Benin, Timbuktu, and Palermo. In the east, there's Krakow, Samarkand, and Angkor. In the west, there's Tenochtitlan, buried beneath Mexico City today, which was home to the Aztecs, and Cusco, which was home to the Incas. The image on the right here is of Cusco, known as the two-mile-high city due to its elevation, and you see the city just by the foot of the Andes mountain range. At this point in history, journeys between cities were slow, and navigation was very rudimentary. Though Europe was by now all figured out to the geographers, but outside of Europe, very few of the cities would ever even have heard of one another. At the end of the 15th century, there's a huge leap forward because of a precise moment in history that changed the economic and political history of the world, and that is when Christopher Columbus discovered, or rather rediscovered, what was referred to at the time as the New World. We know it today as North America. And Vasco da Gama, a year or two later, traversed the Cape Route to the Indies from Europe. We now have great shipbuilding industries and highly developed navigation skills where we enter the early modern world, which looks and operates very different from its predecessors. The image shown here is a map covering the entire world according to its 17th century conception. Travel, for example, between London and the Spice Islands in India then became possible which took away from the status of the Mediterranean Sea as an international waterway and took away from the importance of Venice as a commercial port city. New cities come to the scene, so we have Vienna as a powerful city in Europe. Russia moved its capital to St. Petersburg, and others like Isfahan, Beijing, and Kyoto in Asia. And there's Mexico City, which succeeded the previous Aztec Tenochtitlan, now sits on top of it. London joins the list of these new cities, and so does Edinburgh with the Scottish Enlightenment. By now, every great city of the world was known to every other. And this brings us to the age of the modern city, which for our purposes starts at around the beginning of the 19th century. You'll notice here that changes are happening fast, over the span of decades rather than centuries like in past ages. To contrast, the ancient world spanned across three millennia, whereas the age of the modern city covers a little over 200 years. The Industrial Revolution has taken place, which brought more and more people from the countryside to the towns and cities. London and Paris are prominent in this time, even cities in North America, which have not made an appearance yet, are now well established. There's Montreal in Canada, and New York, Washington, Chicago, and Los Angeles in the United States. And as you can see, these are cities that we now live in and hear of, unlike cities of the past that we may only know about today because of the well-preserved remains or artworks or paintings. Innovations of this age that make these cities possible are the skyscrapers and the invention of the elevator. In South America, there's Buenos Aires and Sao Paulo. In Europe, there's Barcelona, Budapest, and Berlin. In Asia, increase in prosperity, particularly in India and China, brings about New Delhi, Shanghai, and further west, there's Tokyo. And now, in Australia, there's Sydney. The image on the left is New York City, where you can see the skyscrapers densely packed together and the Hudson River in the distance. And the image on the right is the Shanghai skyline along the East China Sea. And with this quick scroll through history, to learn about the evolution of cities from the very first ones in ancient times to the modern ones we live in and visit today, you get an understanding of how and why these cities developed. And as they continue to grow in size and populations increase, the greatness of these cities is a shifting landscape, and new cities are appearing on the world map.